But thank you guys. Thank you for having us. Thank you for um, inviting us to this conference. I'm just so thankful for a church that values women. Um, man, there is there you you walk in this place and as a woman you're like I am seen and I matter and that is an amazing thing that this church has done and I know it comes from Miss Linda and her heart for women and you can see her I mean I'm like my husband texted me how's everything going you know and I'm like man Linda is in her glory like she this is her jam she is all about this um and and so for those of you who come into this church what a blessing you know like just rejoice in that and make sure that you are grateful to the amazing women that have put this on and invested here and I also want to just say thank you to Frances um we we just met I hadn't you know I've heard of her and her husband but to meet and just to be poured into by someone who has served for so long and given so much of your life to Jesus, you have a voice that we hear, and we appreciate you, and we appreciate your sacrifice, so thank you for that, and thank you to um, Linda today was so transparent in her talk, and I was so thankful for that, because again, just being in ministry, pastors, wives sometimes cannot want to share and be honest about their own um, situations or what they face, and so I was appre just appreciative of her being so open about that. Um, so we, we know in this place that we serve a God who values women, and I want you to hear that God values women. As Desiree um, ministered tonight, just, man, time after time throughout the word of God, we see that. And I believe that in this place tonight, we are women of value, and we are treasures in the hands of God. And what God wants to do tonight in this last night, I believe that he's spoken this weekend and through this conference, and I believe that God's not done. And I think that um, as we just spend time together looking at his word, the mirror of his word, he's going to change us, and we can leave this place glorifying him and knowing him. That's what he does when we spend time in his word. Um, also, I just switched to natural deodorant, trying to be health conscious, but I want you to know for your benefit that I borrowed Desiree's degree, so we're good, because I didn't want to melt tonight. I'm like, woo! Okay, all right, so thank God for good, strong deodorant. Health goes out the window when you have to speak. <laughs> all right, let's just pray. God, we thank you tonight for your goodness. God, let this place be an oasis, God, a spiritual oasis, a place where we can come to your word and be filled with you, God. We come from all different walks and all different places, and just to be in your presence, we are thankful tonight that you are here, God, that you see us and you are faithful to speak. When we make space, you inhabit this place, God, and we thank you for that. I trust that you will use my mouth as a vessel to speak for you. Holy Spirit, would you come and would you speak as you desire, God? Would you have your way in our hearts? Would we look to your word and be refreshed and healed and changed and renewed in this place tonight? We believe you for that, God. We thank you and we put this time in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so a few months ago, um, I was driving some of my children. It was going to be like my oldest daughter, she's 15, and a friend. And then, But I have four children, so when you have four children, by default, you attract other children, right? So I ended up, I think, with eight kids in my minivan, which, you know, whatever. We, we share seatbelts, whatever you got to do. I mean, that's, that's how... That's how we roll. Um, so my car's jam-packed with kids. I'm, I, I end up being the parent that picks everyone up. I'm like, how come I'm the one that does this? But whatever, I end up being the one. So I'm driving around, and um, they wanted to go to a trampoline park. No worries. All right, pile in, everybody. We're going to go to the trampoline park. Well, as I'm driving, it's in an unfamiliar place to me. And now it's nighttime, and it's dark. And I'm getting older, and I don't have glasses yet. Probably need them. Um, but I'm driving, and just to be totally transparent, I'm not the greatest driver. I've done really well. And Desiree and Francis and Linda can tell you this. I've been the driver this weekend, and I did great. But at home, I'm kind of known as not. I have, you know, I have, we all have our weaknesses, and don't judge, but mine is, is driving. Um, so I'm driving, and it's dark, and I'm like white knuckling the steering wheel because it starts to rain and it's like that rain that's like downpouring I cannot see rain so I'm gripping the steering wheel because if I hold it really tightly I'm going to control my car very well and I'm squinting to see out the window and then I'm looking at my mirrors well they're fogged up because the kids are singing and the music is on and they're loud and I'm like 
Ugh, this is so scary. I can't, I can't see, and I'm feeling like totally out of control trying to drive in the dark um, with children in the car. And so they start singing because it's a great song and everybody knows it. And I'm like, listen, turn the music off because I can't see. And, and they're like, mom, you know, mom. And I'm like, I can't see. And so I, I can't see. Turn the music off. And I, so I'm driving. And then Siri is yelling really mean things at me. And she's saying things like, turn around when possible. And I'm like, leave me alone. I, I'm losing control. And my daughter's going, mom, mom, mom. Like, you're acting like a total nut. You know, and I'm like, Julia, be quiet. I can't see. And if you all be quiet, then I'll be able to see. It makes absolutely no sense, right? But I felt totally out of control because I couldn't see. Our vision is so important. And how many know that dark times create fear? And when fear kicks in, it makes us feel like we can't see and panic can set in. And that's when we end up wanting to control everything. Um, and we can tend to lose our trust in God. And so the theme of this conference is through the looking glass. Um, I'm going to say so much of the same things that... that Miss Francis and Miss Linda and Miss Desiree said, and so just bear with me, but I believe that it's because God has a word for us, and when God says something over and over and over, it's because he wants us to get it, right, and to hear him, so um, let's just read that verse together, so it says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Um, and I just want to say I just appreciate the word of God so much. The longer I serve God, um, when we look at his word, it's alive and it has the power to change us. And so um, we're going to look to his word tonight and I trust that he's going to make his word come alive to us and transform us as we look into the mirror of it. So what is this scripture saying, right? So so Paul's writing in to the church in Corinth. Now, the church in Corinth, it's, I, I don't, for a long time, I was like, oh, the church in Corinth, if he wrote a letter, it was like this big, incredible, established church. No, the church in Corinth was a baby church. Um, and if you think about it, so it, this is a brand new concept, church. Um, in the book of Acts, churches are being launched, but they, like, how do we do church? They're trying to figure it out, right? And the church in Corinth, when he wrote this letter to them, they were actually probably only four years old. So it's a baby church, and they're trying to figure some stuff out. They don't have conferences to go to. They don't have, you know, leadership meetings and teams that they can get together. They're, like, legit babies. Um, they didn't even have a full Bible to read. They had an Old Testament, but they didn't have the full Bible. And so the culture in Corinth, the way, because of where they were located, um, they were, it was uh, right jutting out into the ocean. So a lot of tradesmen landed there. It was like a, um, a melting pot of cultures and religions. And there were temples built to any number of gods. Um, they were extremely wise. They were into philosophy and studying and being studious. And um, they valued pleasure and prosperity. Does it sound familiar to anyone, right? Like the culture that we're living in. Um, but the reason why Paul was writing this is because the culture, right where the church in Corinth was planted, that culture clashed so horrifically with the culture of Christianity and what Christ has called us to be. Um, and so they were also known for their mirrors. And I have a picture that we can put up of what a mirror looked like. I know um, Miss Linda, I think both Miss Francis mentioned it, but the mirrors that they made were... Um, they were pretty incredible for their time, but it was brass and it was hammered out and it had a very dim, it reflected dimly, um, just like the scripture says. It didn't have a clear picture of, of um, what whoever was looking at it. It didn't reflect it true and clear and crisp. And so the behavior in the church was one that was reflecting the world and not reflecting the image of Christ. And so when we think about that and we think about the church in Corinth, we, we recognize that we are, there's the mirror, it's, it's pretty, uh, that was it, that was what they look like. Um, but we also are living in a very dark time. We're living in a confusing time. Um, we, we can't see clearly, just like the Corinthians, Corinthians, everywhere we look, we're seeing a poor reflection of God. We are in a world that is consumed with darkness, and we know that Darkness makes it hard to see, right? There's also a, a devil, a very real 
spirit of darkness that wants to make us live in darkness. And 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 says, the God of this world, that is the devil, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. This is his mission. The devil's mission is to obscure our vision, to keep us in confusion and darkness. Listen, he's working very hard and quite successfully at this. And so he wants us to be uncertain of our purpose, confused about where we're going. And he wants us to be confused about who God really is. He wants to see these reflections of God that are not true. They're false reflections. They're, they're distorted reflections. Maybe there's a piece of truth in them, but they're distorted and they're not reflecting who God really is. He wants us to walk in that and to live in that and be blinded by that. So tonight, oh no, where are my sunglasses? Tonight I have an illustration a live illustration, um, and I need a very brave, young, athletic, possibly, maybe just brave, volunteer. Someone raise their hand who doesn't know me very well. All right, I'll take you. So if we could have the, um, the bright white lights down, and we'll just have the, the stage lights. So I'm going to have you come on over here, and what I have is I have a pair of really cheap, horrible, extremely dark sunglasses, okay? They're probably cataract glasses. I don't know. But you're going to put these on for me. Now, I, I, don't, I don't know you, right? We don't have a relationship. You don't know anything about me, right? And now I'm going to ask you to do some things. How are you feeling about that? Okay. You're okay. All right. Well, she's supposed to be nervous. <laughs> the correct answer is you're very scared. Um, <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask her to do some things, but she doesn't know me, and I don't really know her, but she hasn't, she's no, there's no relationship that we have. But I'm going to ask her, would you follow me? We're going we're gonna to come up these stairs. Careful. I can't get anybody hurt. I'll get in trouble. All right. Okay, now this is, this is I, she's, I'm leading her. She's following me. But what if, what if she had heard that Meredith was a really critical person? What if she heard that Meredith is a very harsh person? What if she's heard that I'm a liar? That, that, that I'm hard to please? What if she's heard that I'm a trickster? I'm going to have you stand right there. What if she's heard that, that I like to play tricks on people? Or that, I'm, that, I'm, that I'm, I don't have her best interests at heart? Can you sit in this chair for me? <laughs> right? So, so all, if she has heard all these things about me, it's going to make it extremely difficult for her to follow my lead and to trust me. Can you um, do a backflip for me on this stage? No? No, all right, just kidding. <laughs> all right, you can take the sunglasses off. Thank you very much for, for being my volunteer. I'm gonna ask now my lovely friend Desiree to come on up. You can find your seat, thank you, appreciate it. Let's give her a round of applause, she did a great job. All right, so Desiree, as you've heard, we've been friends for 10 years. Um, she knows me. Now, we've got the same exact dark, cheap, terrible sunglasses on. The vision that they have is the same, but Desiree knows me. Des, have I ever hurt you? No. Nope. No. Have I ever lied to you? Not that I know of. <laughs> I don't think I have. <laughs> Forgive me if I have no. Um, so, so I have always treated her with kindness. Can you follow me up these stairs? She knows that I love her family. I love her kids. She knows that I, I have her best interests at heart. She knows that I've got her back. She knows that I, I'm going to have you have a seat in that chair, that I am, that I'm kind, that I, I am gentle towards her and her family. And so if I told Desiree, Desiree, we're going we're gonna to now do some somersaults over here on this stage, she'd be like, well, you're nuts. But she would do it because she trusts me, right? Because there's relationship there, because she knows who I am. And I know who she is. I know her fears. I know what Desiree likes, what she does. I know what aggravates her. I know what she likes to do to relax. I know her, and she knows me, and there's a relationship there and a trust there. All right, you can take the sunglasses off. So these sunglasses, thank you. Let's give Desiree a round of applause. And you can turn the lights back on. So these these sunglasses, it was the same, they had the, the ch chance of the having the exact same vision, right? Nothing was different between the lenses which they saw, the image that they saw. 
but it's the trust in the relationship of who's leading them. It's knowing who's leading you. And so let's go back to our scripture, and, and um, I'm just going to paraphrase it. It says, right now we don't see things clearly. It's a blurry image that we're seeing. But one day we will see God face to face, and when we do, we will know and understand everything, just like God knows everything about us right now. And so I want to talk about our view of God and how we view God. Our world has made our perception of who God is extremely cloudy. We have, like I said, there's false gods everywhere you turn. This, there's Christianity that has no representation of God. There are churches that stand and say, we are a Bible-preaching church, and you watch and you go, that is not the God that I know. We've been told stories about God that, that he's a judge who's waiting to drop judgment on us, that maybe because of our past things we've done, that he's harsh, that he's hard to please. We have people around us who are supposed to represent Christ to us. By design, families... Moms and dads are supposed to be representation and represent the image of God to their children. This is part of God's plan for us. They're supposed to display what love looks like for us and bear the image of God. And when that's damaged, when we have a mom and a dad that don't show us that love, our perception of who God is is changed. It affects us deeply. We were created in the image of God, to bear his image to those around us. That was part of God's design in Genesis. He put his image into us. Genesis 5 verse 1 says, When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. We are supposed to be image bearers. We were designed, we were designed, you were designed to show people around you the image of Christ. That's in our DNA. But when we're rejected by our families when we're mistreated by people, when we have grandparents who could give two blanks about us. <laughs> I don't know what I was going to say. When we have people that turn their backs on us, when we have teachers who are supposed to write care for us and, and lead us, but when they, you're dumb. You're never going to get this. You're never going to amount to anything. People in authority that are supposed to be a reflection of love and kindness to us, when they don't do that, it damages how we see God. And what about when we look at other Christians, right here in the house of God, what about when you're serving under someone? That person who you're serving under is supposed to lead you, right? Supposed to show you what it looks like. And next thing you know, you, you're, you were talking about me? You were gossiping about me? Well, you know what? I don't, I don't think I really want anything to do with this. I think I'm all set with this Christianity thing. It damages how we view God. This is my personal experience. So I was a church kid, um, Thank you, Jesus, I was a church kid. I am super thankful for that. I used to be, um, you know, had a, I had a hard time thinking about my testimony for a long time because, oh, I never did drugs. I never drank. I never, like, I never had a deliverance moment. But I am thankful today that God gave me the gift of being raised in church. But I was raised in a church, um, a church that taught me some incredible things, just some, some disciplines, Christian disciplines that matter. I was taught to pray. I was taught the value of reading my Bible, of being faithful to the house of God. That was something that was drilled in me from a young age, and I, and I am so thankful for that, and I appreciate that. But the church that I was in did a very poor job of showing me the grace of God, um, of showing me the love of God, that God is merciful, that he's gentle in how he deals with us. And so um, I... I had a hard time. I, I, in lacking grace, I found myself struggling. I, I, never, I was never good enough. I beat myself up feeling like, oh, God is just not pleased with me. I, if I'm not praying every morning, I, it was like boxes I had to check off. If I'm not faithful to pray every morning, if I'm not in his word consistently, it was like I, I, it was transactional. I needed to come, do these things. God was happy. Miss a few days, whoop, God's mad. It was like this, and, it, and that was me. That was my perception of who God was. And how many know that how can we walk, walk in victory when we don't trust God, when we don't have a clear picture of him? And so, unfortunately, for me, it wasn't until my husband and I were, we left our home church and were sent to begin pastoring a church that I had to really dig in. And God told me, if you want to know me, you need to look at my reflection yourself. 
because I found myself in a church where, okay, now my husband's the pastor, love the man dearly, but he was a brand new pastor. He was, you know, writing sermons to baby Christians. It was baby food. And so, and then I'm, and then I show up at church and I'm like, oh, I'm okay. I'm in the nursery. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to run the worship. Now I'm going to take him and then I'm going to do the nursery. And, oh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to do Sunday school too. Oh, I'm going to actually be the church van driver. I'm going to drive everybody around, drop them all off and then pick them all up. You're just busy. If you've ever been in ministry, right? You're busy. Go, go, go. And I found myself trying to pour into these people who were desperate for God with a very shallow well that I wasn't filled up. I didn't know God. And I was like, man, I know, I know God is good. I know God is true. But God challenged me. If you want to know me, you've got to look at me. You've got to get into my word and see my reflection. And that's going to give you deep, deep roots. And thank you, Jesus. He, he uses everything. He uses our mistakes. He uses everything to draw us to him. He's faithful, consistently faithful. Um, and so how we know him is by his word. Life is so confusing and like I said, the devil wants us to walk in darkness and live in darkness, but we can know God more and more by knowing his word and spending time with him. And I'll never forget the first Bible study that I did as a pastor's wife that made me get into the word of God. And man, I was undone. God wrecked me with his word. Things about him began to come. I actually studied um, about, hey, about Elroy, the God who sees. I remember like sitting at my little table crying like, God, you are the God who sees. This is incredible from his word. Just looking at his word, God made himself come alive to me. And so when we look at this, this verse and we think about why Paul wrote this, right? So what does everyone know? First Corinthians chapter 13 is known. What is it known for? What's that chapter? This is the, the love chapter, right? This is the poetic, beautiful, lovey-dovey love chapter. Um, it's, and it is a beautiful description of love, but Paul didn't intend for this to be a flowery poem that we read at weddings. Actually, he was um, right yelling to the Corinthians church. Like, you know how when you text and you're mad and, and you're like, text your husband in all capital letters, did you seriously leave your clothes on the floor? You know, like, or whatever your, your constant battle is, and you're, it's all capital letters. If he, if he could have done this in all caps, that's how he wrote to the Corinthian church. He was upset with them. You can go back and you can read um, chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 for yourself. Listen to his tone. Listen to how Paul wrote this. He was upset with them. And he's upset with them because they were hot messes. Um, they were fixated on their spiritual gifts. They were consumed with their spiritual gifts. They were trying to outdo each other with, uh, my, my gifting is so big and so great. I'm going to speak before you in church. I'm going to speak louder than you in church. Oh yeah, well watch me. I'm going to speak in tongues longer than any of you can speak in tongues. And they were being rude. There was no grace. They weren't gentle. They were being rude. They were cutting each other off in church. Like someone would just start to prophesy and someone there would jump up and be like, I got something to say. You can just sit down and be quiet. And it was this mess of a church happening. They would show up to have communion and communion was a full meal that they would share together. And the people who were wealthy would show up first because they didn't have to work that day. And they'd sit in the best seats of the house and they would eat all the good food. And then the people that had been working all day would come part of the church to have communion, and they literally would have crumbs left. Like, there would be no meal for them, and they couldn't even sit in the good seats of the living room. They had to sit out in a total different part of the house. This is how the church was behaving. So Paul was not happy with them because they were not reflecting the image of the gospel and of God. The emphasis is on love in this chapter. It's on love because love is where it starts. Nothing else matters unless we have love. No ministry matters unless we have love. No amount of knowledge matters unless we have love. No amount of popularity, of influence matters unless we have love. And we only are reflecting God when we love. So Paul's trying to get through to them, listen to me. Listen, love is where it begins and where it ends. This is where we have to land. And so let's go back and read uh, together 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to read verse 4 through 8 and then skip to verse 13. It says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. 
It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Three things will last forever, forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Wow. Like, that is incredible. That is a kind of love that I go, man, I crave that love, but who? Who can love like that? Who can attain to that kind of love? Does that love actually exist? Well, the Bible tells us about God, right? What's one defining character about God that we know? God is love. 1 John 4, 8 says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. God is love. Paul was taking them back and saying, listen, this is what we need to reflect. This is the God that we serve. When you can't see clearly, look to this. This is who God is. All of these beautiful things that we just read are a description of our God. That's the God that we serve. That's a true, crisp, clear picture of God. Just as I had my friend and and Desiree put those glasses on, it's hard for them to trust if they don't know my nature or character because they don't really know me, right? Desiree knows me. My other friend, she didn't, we just met tonight. She doesn't know me. How do you trust when you don't really know? 1 John 4, 16 says, we know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. That is where we can land. Ladies, we can park ourselves right there. That love is our God. That's your God. That's the God who's calling your name. That's the God who formed you and made you. He is that, all of those beautiful things. And so we have a choice to put our trust in his love. It's not in what we see. It's not in the poor reflections. It's not in your past. It's not in what's been done to you. It's not in what the, the, the Christians that you go, are you seriously a Christian? Not that. We put our trust in Jesus, the Son of God, who was given for us out of love, God's gift of love to us. And I found this quote, and I just thought it's so powerful. It says, human love, even at its best, may fail. We look for human love. Some of us make it our lifelong goal, right? Desperately wanting to be loved. But even at its best, may fail diminish and even disappear. But the love of the Lord Jesus reproduced in us by his spirit does not fail but goes on and continues where human love stops. God's love never runs out. God knows us completely as the scripture told us um, in our verse that we read, our theme verse, as I have been fully known. God fully knows you. And what does he say about you? He says all of those things about love. That's what he says about you. That's who he is. And he sees clearly everything is complete to him. He sees it all. Listen, he sees all of you. You are fully known in this place. He knows everything. 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 Do you know what that means? Everything. My past, things that I am ashamed of that nobody else knows, God knows. I am fully known. And do you know what he says about me, knowing all of those things? He's patient. He's kind. He's never rude. He keeps no record of wrong. Our God keeps no record of wrong. That's our God. That's who we serve. He's never going to give up. His love never gives up on you. You might be sitting here tonight going, why am I here? Why did I wander into this place tonight? Because God's love never gives up on you. Because God's drawing you. Because he won't quit. He chases, like we sang this, this song tonight, it's a reckless love. Listen, it's a love that never stops. He comes after you and you say, yeah, but, but look at me. My mom abandoned me. Our God is a God of adoption who says, you are my child and I've adopted you into my family. Yeah, but my dad rejected me. God says he's a father to the fatherless. 
But I've been heartbroken. He is near to the broken and binds up all their wounds. Listen, I'm uneducated. How can he use me? Because he says he's chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. But I'm weak. I'm sick. I'm physically sick in my body. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. Yeah, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know my past and my sins. God says, though your sins are scarlet, they will be washed whiter than snow. That's the miracle of the cross when we come to him. This is our God, ladies. This is the God that we serve who sees you and fully knows you, is willing to wash it all away to make you new. That's what he's done for me in my life. That is the goodness of God. What we read tonight is a true reflection of God. It reflects his goodness. So now where do we find ourselves? Because we held up the mirror of God's word. Do you find yourself as someone who's been seeing a poor reflection of God? That you have not seen God as he truly is. That maybe this, these verses about love have made you go, well, I don't, I don't know that God. I don't know that character. I don't know him that way. Or maybe you're someone who says, you know what? I know. I know him. I know that. I've experienced that love then are you making a reflection of him known to the people around you? Because we have a choice to make tonight. That if we say, I have, I have only seen false images, I have seen poor reflections of God, then we have a choice to get up tonight and say, God, I choose to know you for who you are. God, I will make it my lifelong goal to know you, God, to look to your word, to see a true reflection of you. And if we do know God, then we have a choice to say, God, I will stand in this place wherever you ask me to go and shine your light and be a reflection of you to the broken people that I encounter. God, I will love on them with everything that's in me. I will love on them because your love has filled me up. But it's a choice that we have to make that we can be the ones spreading that love. I believe there are women in this place tonight who can be changers, world changers. In Lehi? Yes, in Lehi tonight. That if when you let God, let him arrest your heart, let him get a hold of you, let his love change you, let it wash over you. I don't care about your past. I don't care what your relationship with God has looked like up until this point. Tonight can be a night where you say, God, I will surrender all to you. God, I want to reflect you to everyone around me. If you would use me, God, and he will. That's the God that we serve. He says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all. With unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. We are being transformed. How? When we open up this word, when we spend time. I'm so thankful for the worship tonight that they didn't rush through it, that they allowed us to spend time because when we sit in the presence of God, when we sit in prayer. When we sit with this open our laps, I don't care if you read one scripture for three weeks straight, I've done that. But you sit with it and you say, God, you are good. God, let this word change me. That's when we're transformed from glory to glory. That's what his word does. I want to just end with a, a story that um, recently was made known to me. So we, we have a precious young girl in our church. I've known her, um, I want to say, since she was 11 years old. She's 17 today. And she actually came and sat with me and Desiree and just said that she wanted to share her story with us. And um, this, this girl, man, I love her. She, everyone who meets her loves her. She's a powerful little girl. And she has had a heart for God since she was little. She would come raised by a single mom who works hard and diligently for her three kids to provide for them. And many times this little girl would have to find her own rides to church. And she'd come. And then Desiree reminded me she would come to our youth group when she was the only girl in the youth group, and she'd come and she'd sit really quiet all by herself and never offer up any, any interaction, no words, just come and sit. But this little girl loved God. She loves God. She would always spend time in his word. My, my daughter's friends with her, my daughter would say, man, she's always in that Bible app, like, man, highlighting these scriptures, sending me things like God's word was a part of her daily life from the time she was little. She knew who God was was and knows who he is and he's been walking with her 
and she's someone who's filled with joy. You can just sense it when you're around her. It's, it's, it's God in her. Um, she's also been a witness all through high school, this little girl. She holds strong. Everybody knows she's a Christian. She holds strong to her testimony. She doesn't bow down to the weight of the world, to peer pressure. She stands firm in that. She also makes it, she's very vocal about saving herself for marriage, that this is a stand that she takes, and she believes in that. So she came to us and told us this story um, that one, one night after school, she had to stay really late um, after school. And she, because her mom works a lot, she's providing for her family, she was at work and she couldn't pick this little girl up. And so then she reached out to some, some family members um, and just worked out that no one, no one is free to give her a ride. And she had a friend waiting with her as well. And so finally someone said, hey, you know what, I'll pay for an Uber for you to come home. And so the Uber came and she was like, ah, oh, you know what, this friend of mine, they... I'm really concerned that they're really going to be stuck. Like, they don't have anyone, not even a chance of anyone picking them up. And so she gave the Uber to her friend, and she said, you take it. That way you'll get home safe, and I'll figure it out. I, I have people I can contact. So she ends up reaching out to this young man um, who she had known mutually. He, his siblings were friends with her siblings, and so she thought, okay, I know this kid. And um, his mom knew her mom. And they'd hung out in groups before. So she, he says, no problem. I'll be right there. I'll come pick you up. I'll give you a ride. So she gets in the car, and he starts driving, and she says, wait, I, 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 my house is over there. My, my house is that way. And he's like, yeah, yeah, don't worry. I'm, I'm actually going to take you to my house because my mom's there. And so I, you want to come by and see my mom? And she's very gentle, and she's, she's like, oh, I, all right, I guess we can go see your mom. And so she, she, he takes her to his house, and as you guessed it, the, this, this kid was a predator. Um, and so he brings her inside, and he sexually assaults this little girl. And so I'm listening to the story, and my heart's broken because this little girl's a good girl. She's a girl who has done all the right things. And I'm, and I'm listening to her, and I'm going to myself, God, that's not fair. It's not fair that this happened. And at the end of her story, she's telling me that she was explaining it, her story to a friend, and she goes, but you know what? God didn't cause this because I know God. My God's a good God, and I know God loves me. And the reason why she was able to have confidence, this little girl's already using this story, this story that's dark and broken, and she was stolen from, and she was violated, and she could very easily turn and say, God, why? But she says, you know what? I know my God. And God's using her story already. She said to me, you know what I think? I think God's going to use my story to help other girls who've walked through this. And she has such a confidence because she has known God. She's seen a clear reflection. She knows that her God is a God who's gentle and kind, who never gives up. Her God is a God of love and mercy and healing. That's the God that she serves, and she knows that. And so wherever you find yourself tonight, you could be in the darkest moment. I don't know where you're at. And in this room, like Desiree mentioned, there are any number of women who are facing right now difficult situations. And my heart breaks for you if you find yourself in a situation like that of trauma or abuse. But can you hear me tonight? God is a good God. He's a God of love. He sees you. And if you would open up his word, if you'd come in this place tonight and say, God, let your presence fill me. God, show me your goodness. God, I want to encounter your love. Baptize me in your love. God will do that. He's able to heal every wound, to bind up every broken place in your life. That is the God that we serve. Jesus Christ, that is his name.